G. Marshall. A man may rid himself of a wife, a house, and all his worldly possessions and flee to the farthest corner of the earth, or even today to the moon. But there remains one tie he cannot sever as long as he lives, his memories. But how far back can man remember childhood, birth, or do the ties of memory stretch back over a span of years and reach into other places and other times? I need you, John. I need your love. I have always needed you. You have me, Ilsa. I'm yours. Then you remember, John. You remember the old life. And you will return and live that life with me. The only real life, my darling. You and I and this life are enough for me. John, darling. The past, present, and future are all one. Look into my eyes. Look deep to find my love. And your soul. Our mystery drama, The Velvet Claws, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Murray Burnett and stars Gordon Gould. It is sponsored in part by imported Vigna Rosé wine and Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Man has always sought his heaven on earth. Each of us secretly dreams of some faraway place where we'll live out our lives in quiet contentment, free from the troubles and cares of everyday living. But have you ever thought about what you'd do if you really found such a place? Let me tell you the story of a man who did find such a place and who went from this Shangri-La directly to a psychiatrist. Dr. Hazard... Maybe you can help me find some explanation of what happened to me in that damnable town. There must be some reason why I felt the way I did, and why I saw what I swear I saw. You'll make it easier for both of us if you started at the beginning. I'll have to start with the train, the train that took me to the town. It was the hottest day of the year. Without air conditioning, that second-class compartment was like an inferno. Why were you on the train? Returning to Paris and Orly Airport. The last leg of my European vacation. And it was hot. Sweltering. Which was a sensible reason for me to get out of my stifling compartment and walk along the platform. It, it was then that the idea struck me. It was so extraordinary that I myself was surprised. And that idea was... Not to get back on the train, but to stay over where we had stopped. And take a different train the next day, when it might possibly be cooler and less crowded. Uh, you'll forgive me if I don't see anything unusual about that. Oh, you don't know me, Dr. Hazard. My life for 41 years has run on tracks, just like that train. I get up at the same time every morning, eat the same breakfast that my sister cooks for me, catch the same train to the same office, and get home at the same time. I'm an accountant. And I always take my one-month vacation in the same place. So when I suddenly decided not to get back on the train, I was surprised at myself. Go on. Well, particularly because the train was about to start. I ran alongside the train to the window of the compartment where I saw the man with whom I had shared the compartment. I shouted to him in my bad French to please hand me my valise. To my dying day, I'll never forget the look he gave me. Half warning, half revulsion. But he handed me my bag and shouted a long sentence. I only got the last part, but I'm sure that he was warning me. I, I remember the last words, which were, A cause de sommeil et a cause de chat. A cause de sommeil et a cause de chat. That's it exactly. I think it means, because of sleep, 
And because of the cats, I got the strangest feeling that he was trying to tell me not to remain in the town. Uh, I'm sorry, but I can't make it any clearer than that. Well, that'll do. Go on. Now, outside the station, I saw it was a very small town. And as I looked around, a taxi cab pulled up. Taxi? Yes. Uh, can you take me to a good hotel? There is only one. The inn. They will make you very comfortable. <laughs> it doesn't really matter. I'm only going to be here one night. <laughs> you might change your mind. Our little town has a way of growing on people. Uh, do you happen to know what time the train to Paris comes through here tomorrow? Same time every day. 3.45. Could I arrange with you to pick me up tomorrow in time to catch the 3.45? Sure thing. Good. But if you happen to change your mind and want to stay a while, all you have to do is tell Madame Duchesne she runs the inn. <laughs> You're quite a booster for this town. Uh, so is everybody who lives here. Uh, here we are, Dean. What's that racket? Uh, just cats. People around here keep a lot of them. Because of the cats, the man had said. Maybe it was those words, or perhaps the cats I'd heard, that fired my imagination so that my first glimpse of Madame Duchesne sitting in a chair near the desk, knitting, reminded me of a tremendous cat, a large, fat mouser. She looked up as I entered. Do you have any other bags? No, I'm only staying the night. Do you want me to pay in advance? No, not sensible. You might decide to stay longer. Whatever you say. Should I assign the register? Mm. It is on the desk. I will get someone to take your bag up. Well, that won't be necessary. What's this? The register. No. No. My name's down here. I it's written here. John Latour. <laughs> Dr. Hazard, my name was there. Written clearly and spelled correctly. I swear it, Doctor. I believe you. Well, can you explain it? Well, how did Madame Duchesne explain it? <laughs> It was the strangest thing. Her voice was soft and running, and it seemed to me as if she were stroking me when she said soothingly, Gently, young man. It does a blood no good to get so excited in this heat. But my name's written down here. Of course it is. That train must have been like an oven, and you must have suffered in all this heat. How did you know I came by the train? How else would you have come? But my name here in the register... You will feel so much better after you have rested. Are you telling me that I wrote my name in this register? What does it matter? Madame, I'm not suffering from the heat. And I'm not crazy. I never wrote my name in your register. And I intend to find out how my name got there. And so you shall. After you have had some rest. Dinner is at 6.30. We are very early people here, and we cherish quiet nights. Peaceful. That's the only word I can think of to describe the way I felt. I felt soothed and, and, and stroked like a cat. Like a cat? <laughs> yes. It's silly, but... The warmth and stillness made me feel like, uh, like purring. And yet you experienced no feeling of alarm. Not then. It's hard to remember feelings, Dr. Hazard. Although they were very strong at the time. I was about to propose an experiment. Have you ever been hypnotized? No. Do you have any objections if I try to put you under? I don't think so. But uh, is this part of your usual procedure? I have used hypnosis where I thought it might help. Can you hear me, John? I hear you. It's your first day at the inn. You're in your room. How do you feel? Peaceful. Quiet. Everything's velvetized. Velvetized? Smooth and furry, like the room is fur-lined. 
And you're going down to dinner? Not yet. First, I want to take a walk in the town. It's just after sunset, and dusk is covering the quiet, peaceful streets. Are there any people? Oh, yes. Men and women all busy and paying no attention to me. No. No, that's wrong. They're watching me. Closely. Very closely. Ignoring me is all a sham, a pretense. They're watching me. You discover this right away? No. Not right away. Not till after I sit down. Where? Where did you sit? On top of the wall of the old fortifications. I can see down into the valley. Almost the whole town lies below me in the last of the sun. And there's music. The music is strangely beautiful. It has a definitely feline quality. Now and again, I even hear the plaintive meow of a cat. But somehow, it belongs. Suddenly, the music stops. I'm hungry. And I remember Madame Duchesne telling me that dinner was at 6.30. I feel it's important to please her. I don't know why, but I do. And I start back to the inn. Hurrying back? Oh, no. No one ever hurries. I stroll back. And my eye is caught by a small porcelain figure of a girl in a shop window. The uh, porcelain figure of the young girl in the window. How much is it? I uh, do not know exactly. You don't know? You see, monsieur, the price varies depending on the customer. You might be able to buy that figure at a ridiculous low price. Oh, come off it. You already know I'm interested. You don't have to give me any phony sales pitch. How much is it? Please... How can you believe that I would play tradesman's games with you, monsieur? Oh, no. Never with you. Look, I don't want to be late for dinner. How much? Uh, Thirty-five francs. Well, that seems a bit high. It is a beautiful porcelain. Uh, But uh, seeing who you are, I might let it go for twenty-five. And just who do you think I am? Uh, excuse me, monsieur, but uh, my cat is hungry. Well, the cat can wait. I am sorry, but uh, we do spoil our cats here. So I will allow you to examine the little figure. And if you want it, just leave 25 francs or uh, whatever. The price is not important. And he disappeared into the back of the shop. All at once, I was afraid. Afraid of the quiet, dark shop afraid of the porcelain figure in my hand. It's so quiet, and yet I sense with every fiber of my being that there's activity, intense activity going on around me. I can't hear it, and I can't see it, but it's there, and it's sinister and dark and disturbing. John! John Latour. uh, Oh, Dr. Hazard. I was under, wasn't I? Did you learn anything? Something was beginning to disturb you. I didn't like what was happening, so I brought you back. I don't remember anything. You were in a shop looking at a statuette of a girl. Oh, yes. Yes. That crazy old man mistook me for someone else. Did you ever find out who he thought you were? Not then. I went back to the inn... Had a good dinner, went to bed. And the next day, I was out in the courtyard waiting for the taxi driver to pick me up. I kept getting more and more nervous as the time passed and he didn't arrive. Madame Duchesne kept assuring me he'd be there in time for me to catch my train. I remember my relief when I heard the car coming. Why are you so late? Up right in, monsieur. I will have you at the station in no time. Didn't you cut a little fine? <laughs> Nothing to worry about. You will be waiting on the platform when the train pulls in. Although I must admit I am surprised. I thought you would decide to stay over. I know you did. I told you I wouldn't. So you did. So you did. What's wrong? Nothing. Just the engine acting up. I will take a look under the hood and have a running in a moment. 
Are you sure you have enough gas? I had a full tank this morning. There is no need for you to get out, sir. I can fix it. There's a train. Uh, get my bag. Not too much use in that. You could never make it walking. Well, can't you fix it? I, I am afraid not. It looks like my battery is gone. You mean I'm going to miss the train? Uh, today's train. There will be another one tomorrow. But I wanted to... Why I... don't you walk back to the inn and stay over one more night? I will bring your bag after I get this thing moving. <laughs> Missing a train is always an unsettling experience. But when that missed connection forces you to return to a town seemingly possessing a secret life, where the townspeople seem intent on spinning some soft, invisible web to catch and hold you, then the simple fact that you've missed a train takes on overtones of terror. I'll be back in a moment with Act Two. When asked the question, how was your vacation? Many of us give the standard answer. Great. All I need now to recover is another vacation. However, in our tale, when John Latour returned from his vacation, he felt he needed a psychiatrist. And not just an ordinary run-of-the-mill doctor, but a specialist in the extraordinary. A man Latour hoped would be able to find a semblance of sanity in the strange and sinister events that befell him in the tiny French town of Rouen. Dr. Hazard, it's difficult sitting here to do justice to the emotions that tore at me as I walked back to the inn after missing the train. A mixture of rage, curiosity, and, and surprisingly, relief. Well, can you tell me which was the strongest? No. No, I can't. Well, now let's try to sort them out. You were angry because you thought you'd been tricked into missing the train. I didn't think. I knew. That taxi driver's battery was fine. He deliberately... All right, all, all right, all right. We'll assume that was so. Now, why curiosity? Well, everyone seemed to know me. Why? Who did they think I was? I felt very strongly that I had to do something. Had to make a decision. And last, you mentioned relief. Yes. In a strange way, I was happy to be going back to the inn. But I didn't go directly. I don't know why, but I decided to go back to the shop where I'd seen the porcelain figure I liked. Ah, monsieur, welcome back. I'll take the statuette now. I've decided to buy it. Oh, I am so sorry. It is sold. Uh, perhaps there is something else. Oh, I don't believe you. Monsieur does not mean that. Monsieur knows that I would never lie to him. Why not? Well, don't just shrug your shoulders. I asked you a question. What's so special about me? Monsieur should know that there are others who can answer that question better than I. Who? Oh. For one, the king of cats. The king of cats? Are you kidding? Or the queen, monsieur. The queen. When I returned to the inn and passed Madame Duchesne's knitting placidly in the courtyard, I had the strangest feeling that this big woman might leap upon me when my back was turned and with a single blow break my neck as if I were a mouse. At any rate, nothing happened. And as it was growing dark, I went up to my room to wash before dinner. There were no lights in the hall to my room. There was a sharp turn just before my door. And as I put out my hand to feel my way, my fingers touched something that moved. Terrifying? Strangely enough, no. What I touched was soft and warm, indescribably fragrant, and about the height of my shoulder. It reminded me somehow of a furry, sweet-smelling kitten. But I knew it wasn't, because I heard the rustle of skirts and then footsteps as whatever it was slipped past me and was gone. And then you realized it was a woman. A girl. And, Doctor, I felt... 
I can't tell you how or why, but I felt she had kissed me. Kissed me full on the lips. And I liked it. There's nothing strange about that reaction. For me, doctor, I'm 41 years old. And as you know, a bachelor living a very ordered existence. Believe me when I tell you that that kiss, if it was a kiss, set my veins on fire. But that was nothing compared to what happened when I went down to dinner. Monsieur, allow me to introduce myself. I'm Ilsa, Madame Duchesne's daughter. I hope you are enjoying your stay with her. <laughs> you can hardly call it a stay, mademoiselle. I've been here only one day and I leave tomorrow. Oh, but monsieur must not leave so soon. I promise monsieur will be well looked after. <laughs> you make me wish I could stay longer, but... Oh, you must. There are so many things Monsieur has not seen yet in our little town. <laughs> Isn't it strange? I have that feeling, too. Oh, then it is settled. You will stay. Why do I feel that not only you, but everyone else is interested in me? Why do all of you find me so interesting? Monsieur has only to look inside himself for the answer. <laughs> Don't think I haven't. But I'm still baffled. Then I shall help you find the answer. Tomorrow. <laughs> From the top of this wall, you can see the whole town. Oh, is it not beautiful? You're beautiful. Oh, thank you. Look, you see that old, old house there? Yes, it seems abandoned. It is. That is where my family lived many years ago. Oh, and that big aristocratic-looking mansion, who lives there? Oh, no one now. But that was my mother's house, also years ago. What happened to, to make your mother decide to abandon a great house like that? Oh, this wasn't always the quiet little town you see now. It was full of tourists and townspeople. But it was the ignorance of the people that made it as you see it now. Ignorance? Mm. You see that large square over there to your right? Yes. That was where they burned the men and women, the ignorant, called witches. Witches? There were witches here? So many people believed years ago. And after they burned many good people, the town died with them. And now it is peaceful, quiet. Precisely. And there are many of us who think perhaps it is better this way. My mother enjoys running the inn. And you? Oh, I adore it. After all, how else would I have met you? <laughs> Well, that, that smoke from the burning leaves. Smoke? Over there. See? Watch and you'll see some flames now and then. Oh, no. Maybe if we got closer, we could smell it. No, it it's one of the most delightful scents no, in the world. No, no, run. Oh. Come quickly, run. What's the matter? No, hurry. We well, must run. Ilsa, wait, oh, wait a minute. Please. Ow! Oh, my can, can you get up? Oh, can you walk at all? I don't know. Oh, it's twisted please. pretty badly. We must get you back to your room. <laughs> And, of course, you believe that the injury to your ankle was no accident. What do you think, Doctor? Did the charming Mademoiselle Ilse nurse you as she promised? I don't know whether you could call it nursing, but she kept me ceaselessly under observation. She was always there, always quiet, always restful, but everywhere at once. I was continually meeting the stare and laughter of her great eyes. She always made me conscious of her female presence. Mm -hmm. How did you feel about it? Delighted. And terrified. Why terrified? Because she seemed to sum up in herself all the strange, hidden forces that operated so mysteriously in the town. She had those marvelous, graceful, feline movements, going smoothly, silently to and fro. Then my ankle was healed enough for me to get around. Ah. Uh. But it is wonderful. You are well, and you walk again. Almost. Let's say I can hobble around. Enough, perhaps, to come down to the dining room? <laughs> Would you be very angry if I told you that I could have gone to the dining room yesterday? Oh, 
Why should that make me angry? Because I made you bring my meals here to my room. <laughs> that does not make me angry, but happy. Because you enjoy waiting on me? Only partly. It is more because you have not mentioned leaving. Even though you are well enough to walk, admit that you find it difficult to leave here. I'll admit that and more. I'm finding it difficult because you are my nurse. And you also like our little town, no? I'm enchanted with it. And enchanted with you. <sighs> I am happy you have decided to stay. You're going too fast. I didn't say I'd stay. Oh, you still have not come to a decision? Well, it's not easy to decide. If you're asking what I think you're asking. Which is? Not just to stay for a while, but... To stay permanently. And that is difficult? <laughs> Surely you ought to understand that you're asking me Then to... we must all try together to help you come to a decision. The right decision. We can't always choose our enemies. But we do have the choice when it comes to our friends. I can almost hear someone quip. When you make a girl like Ilza your friend, you won't need enemies. But who is Ilza? And what is she? An enemy of John Latour? Or is she to be his salvation? I'll return with the answer and Act Three in a moment. The hero of today's story, John Latour, fell in love with a strange, beguiling French girl in a small French town he'd never even heard of. The trouble with John Latour was that at the same time he loved, he feared. And yet he didn't know what it was that made him afraid. He hoped to find an answer from psychiatrist Dr. Kenneth Hazard. And now I come to that afternoon, doctor. The afternoon when, for the first time, Ilsa gave me a glimpse of the dark and secret life of the people of Rouen. Yes. I... I think you're going to find what I'm going to say incredible. Well, why don't you try me? We were walking again along the ruined ramparts. We stopped. I don't remember why. But I remember leaning across the ramparts with Ilsa close beside me. Ilsa... You don't know how much these past few days have meant to me. How much you mean to me. I look at you and it's as if my eyes were open for the first time. You're the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. You do like me then. You know I do. If you like me, you must also like what I do and what I belong to. Belong to? You must take part in our real life. You will come back to us. Come back? The past, present, and future are all one, John. What is this real life you speak of? The old life of long ago. The life to which you too once belonged, and to which you still belong. Why do your words make me think of death? Not death, my love, but the past. This old life, what was it? Our life. The life we led once before and will again. The life you came back to and do not wish to leave. But I did want to leave. I tried to go. You know that. I know. But I have the spell to hold you. The spell of old love. I can make you live with the old life with me. Because the force of the ancient tie between us is irresistible. I mean to have you. For you love me and are utterly at my mercy. Ilsa, this is nonsense. I came to this town wholly by chance. No. You came because I called you. I have called to you for years. And you came with the whole force of the past behind you. You had to come. For I own you and I claim you. No one owns anyone else. Come close. And look into my eyes. Look deep, my love. For the truth lies in my eyes. Tell me what you see. I see forests and mountains and caves. And I see 
You. I see you wonderfully clear. You have leaves in your hair. And you are dressed in rags, but still beautiful. Oh, how beautiful. Go on. Keep looking. I, I see flames and smoke. You're dancing. Dancing before some altar. And there's a figure on the altar. There are others. They're dancing too. And all looking at you with hotly desirous eyes. But you, you're only looking at the man you're dancing with. And who is that man? It's me. I'm dancing with you. I'm your partner. And now you have seen me and us together. Now you have seen the past and you understand everything. No. No, I don't understand. In the life you saw in my eyes, I am a princess. A princess? And my mother is a queen. And now you may kiss your princess. <sighs> you have not forgotten how to kiss. I will show you I, too, have not forgotten. I knew I had to escape. I ran back to the inn, hoping to reach my room unobserved. But the hall wasn't empty. A large, dark thing lay against the wall to my left. When it moved, I thought it was a cat. But then it rose straight up before me, and I saw... It was Ilse's mother. Monsieur has decided then. Ah, that is well. I am content. Here, give me your hands. My, my hands? But of course, for the dance. We go this night to celebrate. Ilse, Ilse, come to us. Come quickly. And suddenly, Ilse was there. And we joined hands. And we, we danced some steps that seemed oddly and... Horribly familiar to me. Ilza was dressed in rags, as I had seen her before. And then others were there, all dancing. And I heard voices crying, To the Sabbath! To the Sabbath! On to the witch's Sabbath! And suddenly, Ilza's mother shouted, It is time! It is time, and we must go! They released my hands, and I found myself alone in the hall. I... Yes? <sighs> Now you're alone in the hall of the inn. And what happened then? Well, I decided to go to my room and lock myself in. I thought I would be safe there. After I'd locked the door, I went to the window and peered out, trying to see what was going on. All around me, the windows of the rooms I thought had been unoccupied were opening. And human forms were dropping from them into the courtyard. But once they were in the yard... They fell upon all fours, and in a split second, they changed into huge, silent cats. Which amazed you. No, that's just it. It was familiar to me. I remembered it all. I remembered that it had happened just like that hundreds of times before, and that I myself had been part of it. <sighs> I knew that if I stayed, I was lost. I knew that with a dreadful certainty. So I unlocked my door and tiptoed downstairs. They had all gone. Well, didn't you think it strange that they should have left you there alone? Very. I couldn't believe I was forgotten. I moved as quickly as I could through the courtyard and to the rampart wall. I couldn't resist climbing to the top because I knew from there I would get a view of the surrounding countryside. And when I reached the top of the wall, I was transfixed by what I saw in the valley below. I saw countless moving forms drifting between the trees and overhead flying shapes in the sky. And you knew what those shapes were. The townspeople flying on their way to the witch's Sabbath. 
I see. As I stood balanced on the top of the wall, a large animal darted swiftly across the open courtyard behind me. And then, with a flying leap, landed on top of the wall next to me. My heart gave a great leap, and I could feel it thudding against my chest. It was Ilsa. See, my love. See where they await us. The woods are alive. Already the great ones are there, and the dance will soon begin. The salve is here. Anoint yourself and come. And my memory stirred with the pungent smell of the salve she'd smeared over her. A smell that was curiously attractive and revolting at the same time. Transform! Transform! Rub well your skin, you fly. Come with me to the Sabbath. The terrible sacraments are prepared. The throne is occupied. Anoint and come. Oh, Satan is there. Satan has come. We will worship and dance till the moon dies and the world is forgotten. Here, let me anoint you. Oh, it burns. Sweet. It is sweet, fire, my love. No, no. Let me think of it. It's been so long, so long. I... Oh, my. No time. No time, my love. What? You wait. Come. Dad, Dad. Intuitively, I knew what I had to do. I had matches in my pocket, and I struck one and set fire to the leaves lying against the wall. Ah! I heard just the scream of the flames ah! sink upward. Foolish luck. Do not think you can escape. Remember, you vowed to be mine forever. Centuries ago. Mine. Mine. No, I never returned to the inn. But how I got back to this country, I don't remember. All I know is that I'm here, and I'm frightened. Of what? Demons, doctor. The demons Ilza unleashed in me. Can you help me fight them? Will you? Before we can talk about fighting, we must understand exactly what it was that happened to you. Whether or not this wasn't just a... A vivid dream. Dream? Look at this mark on my shoulder. Let me open my shirt so you can see it clearly. Yes, I see a faint reddish mark. Yeah, well, that's where Ilza rubbed me with a salve. That should prove it wasn't a dream. Well, what do you think it was? Well, that's why I came to you. It was no dream. Can you offer any other explanation? Perhaps. Have you ever read any books about witchcraft in the Middle Ages? Never. Then there would be no way of your knowing that in the year 1700, the town where you stayed had been a sort of headquarters for all the sorcerers and alleged witches of the entire region. After trial and conviction, they were burned there by the score. That's what Ilsa said. Including two women, a mother and a daughter. So Ilsa and her mother could have been... Could have been what? I don't know. How did you find all this out? I've been doing a lot of research. I've discovered that the inn you stayed at was built upon the very spot where the funeral pyre stood. The pyres that burned the witches. But how does this apply to me? Well, one of two things is true. Either you're a man who's extremely sensitive to atmosphere and auras of places and people. And because of this sensitivity, you dream... I told you it wasn't a dream! Or, and this possibility is fascinating, you and Ilsa and her mother were somehow in that time long ago tangled up in the events that took place there. Are you suggesting... I'm a reincarnation of some 18th century warlock? No, no, no. I, I'm not suggesting anything. You see, we have evidence that some people under hypnosis can recall events and people and conversations that took place centuries ago. And you may very well be one of those. 
And how do we find out? Well, I'm not sure. I'm not sure we can, but I'm interested enough to give it a try. I'm going to visit your little town and answer some questions of my own. And what do I do? I'll be back in a week. Meanwhile, you sit tight. And I urge you, on no account can you go back to Europe because it could be dangerous. Ah, yes. I remember Monsieur Latour. I trust uh, he is well. Oh, he's all right. How's your daughter? Ilsa is well also, thank you. Did Monsieur Latour speak of her? Oh, yes, yes, he did. Madame, can you tell your impression of Monsieur Latour? Most certainly. He seemed a very strange and absent-minded gentleman. And frankly, after his disappearance, I feared he had met with some kind of violence in the neighboring forest. Tell me, is he planning on returning next summer? No, I don't think so. I doubt if he will ever come back. And I think you are wrong, Dr. Hazard. I feel that he will return. Dr. Hazard? Hello, Doctor. This is John Latour. I know we had an appointment as soon as you got back, but I'm calling to cancel it. Well, when do you want to make it? I don't know. Um, I owe you an apology, Doctor. An apology? For what? For wasting your time. I really believe that it was all just a bad dream. At any rate, I won't be able to make another appointment for a while because I'm calling from the airport. I'm off to Europe in half an hour. I'll drop you a line from the old inn at Rouen when I get there. Unfortunately, Dr. Hazard never heard from John Latour again. When John returned to the ancient inn, he might have discovered that his whole previous experience was a flight of the imagination, and nothing ever really happened. Or, perhaps, he married Ilza and lived, as we hope, happily ever after. I'll be back shortly. all had the experience of coming to a place and finding it strangely familiar. In fact, we're sure we've been there before. We try to dredge up memories which would help us recall the reasons for us thinking we'd been there. After this tale, maybe some of us will be happy to let our memories remain cloudy and our subconscious happy. Our cast included Gordon Gould, Arnold Moss, Evie Juster, and Gilbert Mack. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. It's coming from this room. Mrs. Parker! Open up. Open up in there. Break it in. Break it in. (coughs) Mrs. Parker! Oh, Mrs. Parker! No! Oh, no! Open the window! Let me! Lock from the inside. <laughs> Door locked on the inside, too. Key in the lock. Mrs. Parker. Oh, let's get her to the window. Fresh air. No, no. Don't bother. She's dead. But maybe if we can get some air into her lungs. It won't cure a broken neck. <gasps> broken? You can see the way it's twisted, Miss Hall. It's broken, all right. Then she's been murdered, too. Yes, Miss James. She's been murdered, too. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Uncle Ben's Long Grain and Wild Rice. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. (laughs) 